Hi, my name is Lee. In this video, I'm going to share a few experiences I've had and my friends have had with hiking along the coastline here in Northern California and what I've learned in terms of tracking tide charts, knowing what high versus low tides mean in terms of safety at the beach, and why understanding tide charts should be a regular part of your protocol when planning a visit to certain coastal landmarks. When it comes to our ocean and changing tide levels, it's something that occurs in 12-hour cycles. Here we are on the willyweather.com website. As with most tide chart resources, they have this graphical presentation of what looks like a wave horizontally across a consecutive time frame, in this case a five day period. That blue line is basically the height of the tide at that specific time of day. As you can see, every day, every 24 hours, there appears to be a peak and then a low point and another peak and low point. This cycle of high versus low tides rinses and repeats every day just like this. If we go down to this section, and maybe all you care about is that highest peak versus the lowest of that day or half day, then that info is presented here as a simple chart. This view and style of data table is also pretty common across most tie chart resources. On Woolly Weather, you can run a search for a specific date. This is for December 31st, 2021, because I'm going to take you there to Bowling Ball Beach right now. park along the side of the road on Highway 1 and it's a quick hike down to the beach. Round trip from your car to the bowling balls is just one and a half miles total. We got there around 3.20 in the afternoon and we were there for over half an hour. During this period was the lowest tide of the day at around negative 1.05 feet. If we had kept going, there's actually more rock formations on that beach. In our case, we didn't do that. We just kind of stopped right there and explored these rock formations known as the bowling balls. You can see on the ground it's somewhat wet, lots of little puddles, lots of plant life that appears to belong in the ocean and would normally live underwater. You would assume it either rained recently or more likely this ground was underwater even as recently as earlier that day. Based on how far back the water was at negative 1.05 feet, I would guess possibly even at 1 or 2 feet higher would have been okay as well. The bowling balls would probably have still been exposed and accessible. This is just based on similar comments I've read from other visitors. Okay, next we'll take a look at a trip we took to the Point Reyes Crater, also known as the Secret Beach Amphitheater. We did that hike on April 23rd, 2022. We didn't get to the crater until exactly 12.02 p.m., which was at the lowest tide level of that day. At negative 0.76 feet, there was ample territory on the ground for us to walk on. Plant life and sea life were exposed thanks to this low tide. Even through the areas without any sand or beach for us to walk on, and you have to hop over the rocks, all of that terrain was more or less above water, or just at water level. We barely got our shoes wet. Numerous streams that flowed down from the many caverns along this beach, they were extremely shallow as well, so very easy to get past. And so this is how things went on April 23rd, 2022, right around noon, when the lowest tide was at negative 0.76 feet. Let's compare that to another day several months earlier on December 4th, 2021. We were getting to the crater right around 7.15 p.m. The tide wasn't at its lowest anymore, but it was still at around negative 0.06 feet. It was mostly fine. We had dry land to walk on throughout all this, except when we got to a few areas where there's no beach or sand per se, and we got to do jumping and hopping over those rocks. On that night in December 2021, during these portions of the hike, we were submerged in water up to our knees, depending on the surface and the height of the rock we were stepping on. If you slipped or lost balance like I did, you got wet up to your waist. This was also happening while the waves were crashing in on us. They weren't big waves, but it was just one extra issue to deal with. Again, this was at a tide level of roughly negative 0.06 feet at nighttime during the winter. Less than one foot difference compared to our adventure later on on that April afternoon, but we got a somewhat different experience. Why would less than one foot of difference in the tide, according to the recorded data, make that much of a difference in terms of the water that we have to tread through? 
Well, according to National Park Service, there is no tide height that they can provide that can guarantee that it's going to be low or safe enough for you and your group to get onto the beach and get through the beach. Now, there's a couple of different factors involved with this, one of which is the actual amount of sand that is actually on the beach, and that actually differs from season to season. According to National Park Service, generally speaking, there's going to be more sand on the beach in the summer and the fall compared to the winter and the spring. Of course, they also recommend that you check all official tide chart predictions, check all official weather reports and services, and look out for any advisories and warnings, particularly about high surf. For example, with high surf warnings, if you do get such a warning that day, you're going to have a situation where today's tide height might have been the same as yesterday or the week before, but the tide level that was safe yesterday or week before is no longer safe today because of these additional circumstances that are happening. So these factors are just some of the things to consider in addition to the specific tide level that you're taking off of the charts. Another thing to be aware of is what I call the danger zone, which is every area, every part of your hike or trail that you're going to be at, uh, where you're going to be under the risk or potential risk of high tides. As an example, here we are at Wildcat Beach at Point Reyes. This is where Alamere Falls is. To get there, there's a couple different designated trails and trailheads, but they all pass through Wildcat Campground on the north end here. Then you come onto the beach and walk for 1.1 miles to get to Alamere Falls on the other end. And approaching Alamere Falls, I want you to take a look at this innocent looking rock right here. It just kind of sticks out shortly before you arrive at Alamere Falls. You wouldn't think much of it on a day with low tides, such as when I went there on December 5th, 2021. Yes, the day after our nighttime adventure at Point Reyes Crater. But that day at Alamere Falls, we got there right around 1.30 in the afternoon at a recorded tide level of 4.06 feet. That's precisely when this photo was taken. Several minutes later, we're at the falls. This is precisely at 1.42 p.m. when the tide was recorded at 3.68 feet. You see the stream behind me is pretty shallow. We had ample room on the sand to stand on. And there's that rock over there. Let's zoom in on that and pay attention to the front line, the first wave of the water, so to speak. And notice there's still a gap between that and the tip of the wall, the base of that innocent looking rock. And now let's go further back in time to February 24th, 2019, 4.15 p.m. My friend was on Wildcat Beach approaching the falls, and you see here the water is crashing into the rock now. She marked it with the red arrow. She reports that at that moment, they couldn't just walk through that water, as it was up to their knees or even their thighs. And more importantly, the waves were pretty strong as well. To get through, they had to climb over that rock. They had to avoid the water altogether, now, looking at it from the opposite angle, they've crossed over to Alamira Falls side. This is all during a recorded tide of right around 3.85 feet. Very close to the height of the tides that afternoon I was there in December 2021, but we got very different experiences. That's why it's important to know the geography of the area you're hiking to. Facing Alamere Falls, I just covered that rock on the left side. It's basically one side of an enclosure where you're sort of tucked in. Basically, if the water gets close enough up here, you're potentially blocked on both sides. To the right, there is nowhere to go. A short stretch of beach maybe, but other than that, it's all rocks and cliffs. So in terms of Wildcat Beach, Alamere Falls is really the end of the line. Additional geography to know about Alamere Falls is the top of the falls where the cascade is flown down from. Now there really isn't an official trail coming from there, but this is what's been named the shortcut down to the beach. National Park Service didn't create or design this path, they don't support its usage, but visitors climb down and up this route on a regular basis. It's probably about 30 feet high. In the event of an emergency, if you truly do end up trapped at Alamere Falls and you cannot get off of Wildcat Beach, then this shortcut can be your escape. That's exactly what happened later in 2019. My friend was back there at 2.40 p.m. and couldn't leave Alamere Falls because they couldn't get past this part. The recorded tide was also exactly 3.85 feet, but there was so much water this time, they couldn't even get anywhere near that rock. Climbing over that rock wasn't even an option anymore. 
So they went up that shortcut. After climbing to the top, she took this photo at 5.21 p.m. And as you can see, there is no beach. There's no sand. This end of Wildcat Beach is completely covered in water at a recorded tide level of 4.4 feet. Very close to the height of the tides when I got in December 2021. I wouldn't imagine less than one foot of water would make this much of a difference. But this is the outcome and experience that my friend got. In terms of potentially being trapped by the tides, exactly how fast can they rise? Well, that varies from location to location from day to day. But here's an example from Big River Beach at Mendocino Bay. Let's pretend my friend was about to take a morning nap on the beach, living the life without a care in the world. She wakes up from that nap and she would have to stand up now because she's suddenly underwater. This is the photo she took an hour and a half later. Now, going off of tide chart data from willyweather.com, the closest timestamps Willyweather offered and their corresponding tide levels, across this time frame, they recorded a difference from 2 feet to 3.8 feet. That's an increase of almost 2 feet in an hour and a half. Again, this was Mendocino Bay on April 16th, 2022, and just one example of how fast the water can rise on the beach. With all this experience thus far and all the information I've gathered from the tide charts, exactly how would I plan and prepare for a hike to one of these beaches in the North Bay? Well, let's pretend uh, you're going to come with me on a visit to the Point Reyes Crater. Let's plan a trip like that together right now. This is a custom map I created on alltrails.com. Since it's a custom map, you wouldn't be able to directly search for it, even if you have the pro account. I will provide the URL link in this video description, so you can use the link to get to this map and then save it in alltrails under your list of maps. What you see here is five different routes you can take to go from a parking lot and walk all the way to Point Reyes Crater. For this video, I'm just going to describe the routes starting from Limitor Beach parking lot. And you walk down to the beach, go south. Following the green line, you can take a path to get off the beach and instead take the coast trail. Otherwise, we stay on the beach and following the blue line, there's another opportunity to get off the beach and cut over onto coast trail near the coast campground. Regardless, we keep moving south through Santa Maria Beach. Eventually, we get to Sculpture Beach where at this point, no matter which trail you took, they all merge right here, as there is a stairway that connects Sculpture Beach to the Coast Trail. So no matter what route you choose, from here you will have to hike through the rest of Sculpture Beach and then Secret Beach, and then you're at the crater. It would probably take your group one and a half to two hours for this one-way hike, depending on the route you take. For purposes of this video, let's say we're going to take one of the routes for the Coast Trail when we're heading to the crater. That means we will be coming down those stairs because we took either the blue, green, or purple line. And based on this plan, we will define this spot right here as the start of our danger zone, which we'll study the geography of right after we schedule a date for this hike. In my case, I can only go on weekends and I want to go as soon as possible. So we're going to look for dates in the month of May 2022. And I love the data table format on usharbors.com because they show you lowest and highest tides through the entire month on one page. I'm going to scroll down until I find a negative tide because based on my experiences with these Bay Area destinations, my safety benchmark is any tide under 0 feet. And there it is, negative 1.1 feet and negative 0.6 feet, which will happen respectively on the mornings of Saturday, May 21st and Sunday, May 22nd. Let's go with Sunday when lowest tide will hit at 11.28 a.m. In addition to the very lowest tide, we want to know an approximate total range of when the tides will be low enough to get in and off the beach. Again, going with my standard of under zero feet and using the NOAA.gov website where they return data in 15 minute increments. For Point Reyes on May 22nd, we have the first negative tide at 10 a.m. And that continues the negative tides until the last one at 1 p.m. So that's three consecutive hours of negative tides. This is what I call your window of time of safe tides. You have a three hour window of time where the beach will likely be at a tide level that is safe enough for you and your group. Next, we also need a window of time for how long we'll be inside the danger zone. Remember, we're starting at the bottom of the stairways at Sculpture Beach. And from here, it's actually not a far distance to the crater. 
It's just about one third of a mile away. Let's note a few areas that might be extra risky. These rocky sections here that stick out closer to the ocean might have waves crashing into them first, but also they're slightly elevated compared to the ground, compared to the beach. So in that sense, it could be safer up there since it will be above the water level more likely. Next, everyone needs to take a look at this wall right here. If you want to get to Point Reyes Crater, you have to climb down this wall and you have to climb back up on the way out. In the corner over here, it's still going to be at least a 6 foot drop. So make sure everyone in your group is comfortable and confident that they can safely maneuver through this section. Once you climb down this wall, that little area is another perfect example of one of those places where you're sort of inside a cove. You're in an enclosure where you're blocked on one side or both sides. That means if water fills up right here, you need to get out of there and to higher ground as soon as possible. Just another thing to remember. Aside from taking it slowly out of precaution, you're also going to be exploring, right? With the low tides pulling the water back, you'll be able to see the plant life, the sea life, the tide pools. There's also quite a few caves such as this one right next to the crater. This one is long and narrow like a tiny tunnel. Given all that, let's say my group would take 15 minutes to get through all this. Then how much time are we going to spend at the crater? We're probably going to be taking photos and videos and not leaving until we get the perfect group shot. Let's say we need at least 15 minutes to do all that inside the crater. And then another 15 minutes to get back to the stairways. So that's a total of 45 minutes. That's our minimum preferred window of time within the danger zone. Now we've done our homework as far as studying the geography, we've mapped out our route, we've calculated our window of time, but ultimately in terms of scheduling, we need to get there as early as possible. At the very least, we need to get to our final destination ahead of the lowest tide. And one of the reasons for that is when we get there, we need to be able to eyeball in person and monitor the waves and tide levels and get an actual perspective on how good or bad it actually is. That way, when we're there, we can make adjustments to our schedule and to our window of time if we need to. Also, getting there earlier means you're more likely to be able to spend more time at your final destination. And ultimately, you're going to have more time to kind of get in and out if the situation turns bad. For example, if we arrive at the stairways at Sculpture Beach by 10 a.m. during the first negative tide, hypothetically speaking, let's say we realize the tide is too high for our group. We don't feel safe treading through the water at that moment, but since we got there ahead of the lowest tide, the water is still receding. So we wait until 45 minutes later when the water is now low enough for us to walk through without the waves knocking us over. That means we will get to the crater at 11 a.m. The tide should be safe enough for our group to tread back through up until 12 to 12.15 p.m. because they'll be at the same level as it was when we started at 10.45. So right now we are recalculating and honing in on the window of safe tides based on our real life experience in the moment. And it's 1 hour 15 minutes or slightly more than that. This also means we now know the actual time available to us in the danger zone. We can probably get away with being in the crater for at least half an hour since our total window of time in the danger zone can be at least one hour. On our way out, when we get to the end of that danger zone, the stairways, what if you wanted to keep going straight? What if you just wanted to keep hiking along the beach? If that's the case, you would need to pay attention to the waves and water levels and kind of gauge how bad it might get if you continue on the beach. Because remember, right now, you're past the lowest tide of the day and the tide is currently rising, not receding. From here, hypothetically speaking, if you get through Santa Maria Beach and make it to the next opportunity to cut over onto higher ground, up to coast campground, getting to here from the stairways is around 0.8 miles. So how fast can your group walk that distance of over 3 quarters of a mile? Compare that to how fast the tide is rising and how hard the waves are crashing onto your feet and legs. You'll have to negotiate and make a decision on the spot. If you don't think you can beat the waves, then fall back to my default plan. This is the end of your danger zone. You gotta get out of there via the escape route, which is right there. The stairways at Sculpture Beach that take you up to the coast trail.
And that pretty much sums up how our adventure would go at Point Res Crater in terms of how we would deal with the tides and get out unscathed and relatively dry. So to summarize, what I would like you to take away from this video is number one, reading and tracking tide charts. If you don't want to get into the scientifics and technicality of all the data, just remember one thing, the lower the better. You're aiming for the lowest possible tide height and scheduling your adventure around that lowest number. Now with that said, number two, there is no tide height that is 100% safe. It's no guarantee because of all these different factors from the weather to the amount of sand to the season or special warnings regarding high surf. And also number three, that's why it's important to really study the geography and terrain of your trail and identify and define the scope of your danger zone and which areas are going to be the most dangerous and what type of situations you might get stuck in when you're in there. And based on that, number four, window of time. Just figure out how much time you actually want to be there, how much time you actually need to spend to get to and from there, how fast are you hiking, and compare that to the window of time in terms of how many minutes or hours of low tide that you're going to get. That's going to be low enough or safe enough for you and your group. And finally, number five, when you're actually there on the day of your adventure in the middle of the hike, you need to be prepared at all times to change your action plan, to adjust your itinerary and schedule based on what you're seeing and experiencing right in front of you. Because maybe what you read off the tide chart doesn't really match what you're actually facing in the moment. Or maybe everything you learned in my video turned out to be completely wrong. In any case, number five means that when you're there, you're the boss and you got to take action and react as needed. And that covers everything I have to share for today. I want to thank you for listening and watching this video. I hope you found it helpful. I hope the information that I've shared uh, will help you and your family and friends uh, stay a little safer out there and make your adventures go a little more smoothly. So until next time, uh, happy hiking and I will see you on the beach.